Good afternoon. Welcome to the National Ag Tech Forum's May event. I'm Michelle Von Cannon. I'm the Agriculture Program and Event Manager here at NC Biotech. This year, we've been really uh, lucky to partner with two great organizations, Ag Start and Ag Launch, to bring these monthly events to you. So I'd like to have, give a big thank you to both Ag Start and Ag Launch for helping make this happen. I also want to acknowledge our amazing sponsors here in the region in North Carolina, um, HPG, Hughes Pittman Gupton, Global Ag, Myers Beagle, and Smith Anderson, and also, oops, I apparently have not paused that, sorry. And our regional supporting sponsor, Alexandria Launch Labs Ag Tech. So to um, Start off the event. We have a few announcements, so I'd like to inter introduce Aaron Bobe from Myers Beagle. Aaron, hello. Good afternoon. My name is Aaron Bobe, and I'm a partner at Myers Beagle here in Raleigh, North Carolina. Myers Beagle is a law firm focusing on intellectual property with a particular emphasis on patent law. We counsel clients on all matters relating to intellectual property and assist clients in obtaining patent protection for their inventions both nationally and internationally. Our practitioners cover the full range of technologies, including chemical, biological, mechanical, electronic, computer technology, and computer technologies, all of which are relevant to innovation in agriculture today. Uh, innovations can be a combination of different technologies, and so integration across these technologies is necessary in order to obtain strong patent protection. At Myers Beagle, we not only have the experience and training needed to tackle complex inventions, but also work well together and recognize that working as a team can provide the best outcome for our clients. If you have any questions or would like to learn more about Myers Beagle, please feel free to contact me or another at Myers Beagle. Now, switching over to the National Egg Tech Forum, we have some upcoming events that I would like to talk with you about or tell you about. Uh, the first is June 16th and is hosted by Egg Launch. The June 16th forum will focus on connected regions driving farmer innovation. Uh, the next event is going to be on July 21st and is hosted by Egg Start. This forum will focus on food safety innovation. Now you can learn more about both of these events on the, bio, the website, which is ncbiotech.org backslash events. Um, today's event is being recorded and on Monday, you should be able to access a recording of today's forum from the same website, ncbiotech.org backslash events, and that'll be under today's event on the calendar. So a couple housekeeping items for today's talk. First, all questions should be entered in the Q&A tab, which should be at the bottom of your screen. You may need to run your cursor across your Zoom window um, to have that pop up. That's at the Q&A tab. If you see someone's question and you like it, then you can give it a thumbs up, which will move it up in priority. Questions may be answered during the talk as they're relevant, and any remaining questions may be addressed at the end of the program. The chat tab, please reserve for any technical issues, such as any audio visual issues. And then please remember that virtual networking will take place after the program ends, which is at 5.30 and the link to networking is in your email registration confirmation. And in case you don't have it handy, it will be posted in the chat tab um, during the last few minutes of the talk. Now I will turn the floor over to my fellow annual sponsor, Les Thompson from Global Ag. Thank you, Aaron. Uh, good afternoon, everybody. As Aaron mentioned, I'm Les Thompson with Global Ag and iAdvantage Software. Uh, Global Ag serves as an outsource for the ag industry for the product development process. Uh, we've established an experienced internal staff, a board of advisors, as well as an extensive global network of CROs, universities, and other industry organizations to help our clients' specific needs. Uh, our sister company, iAdvantage Software, and its e-study platform officially, efficiently collects, compiles, and reports all of the data associated with the development process. So with the shameless plug out of the way, welcome to today's program, the future of carbon markets. Soil health 
in carbon sequestration was touched on during Ag Start's April forum, which is a great tee up to today's discussion. Carbon markets has become a hot topic over the past few years, and even more recently with President Biden's consideration of a government carbon bank. If, if that is the case, how will this work with existing private carbon markets? What lessons can the US learn from similar models and alternatives other countries have tried? How do we help our farmers transition to these practices and what possible ag tech innovations might help? And how do we create value for all farmers and not just a select few? So with my very limited insight into the answers to these questions, it's time to turn it over to the smart people on the Zoom. I'd like to introduce today's moderator, Dr. Harrison Fell of North Carolina State University. Dr. Fell joined NC State in August of 2016 as a Chancellor's Faculty Excellence Program cluster hire in sustainable energy systems and policy. Dr. Fell is an associate professor in the Department of Agricultural and Resource Economics and conducts research in the fields of environmental, energy, and natural resources economics. His recent work focuses on issues related to renewable energy deployment and integration, policy design elements for emissions regulation, and electricity market regulations. So Dr. Felt, the floor is yours. One second here, there oh, you go. All right, there we go. Uh, uh, well, okay, if I was muted there, uh, uh, sorry for that. Um, uh, I'm just, uh, thank you again for uh, having me today. Um, and um, I'm just going to share a few slides uh, with you all um, to kind of further some of the points that Les was talking about regarding the um, growth in, in carbon markets and in offset uh, mechanisms in particular. Um, and then I'm going to turn it over to our uh, speakers for today, um, the rest of the panel, um, and let them um, describe a little bit about um, their particular angle and expertise in this market. Um, so, as Les mentioned, the growth in um, carbon markets has been quite remarkable. And so, uh, to sort of visualize it, here was a snapshot of where we were about a decade ago in terms of um, different uh, regulations uh, regarding carbon pricing uh, that was happening around the world. And you see it's basically Europe and a few little dots here and there. If we jump forward 10 years, um, we've seen quite a spread uh, of different carbon policies throughout the world. Um, and it's likely that we're going to continue to see uh, countries um, implement national and subnational policies uh, as we all race to try to get to uh, our Paris Agreement uh, levels. Um, if you think about it from a little bit broader perspective, uh, there's been a lot discussed. Uh, if you look at IPCC reports uh, and, and other uh, large scientific reports, there's uh, this sort of clear goal of getting down to net zero emissions by 2050. And so what this figure is showing us is kind of um, where we're at now and, and where we're gonna have to kind of get to, um, according to McKinsey, uh, to kind of keep us on this 1.5 degree Celsius pathway. And what I want to particularly point out here is, is, the, uh, is the blue uh, in the negative area, that's carbon offsets, right? And that carbon offsets, of course, is where um, the ag industry uh, has a, a large role to play. Um, and so as you can see that this, the, the growth in, in what's needed for offsets uh, is quite uh, large if we are seriously going to get to a net zero emissions world by 2050, 
whether that be nationally or, or worldwide. And likewise, um, the growth on the market side is quite large. So there are sort of two ways of thinking about carbon offset markets. One, uh, those uh, offsets that are part of, um, of uh, compliance-based mechanisms within um, federal or subfederal regulations, and then those that are um, voluntary-based. Um, and the growth potential, particularly for voluntary-based, um, is quite large. Um, this, again, is a study from McKinsey um, showing anywhere from, uh, you know, by decades in, about a 15 times growth rate of where we are uh, with regard to carbon offsets markets in the voluntary markets, um, but even up to 100 times that um, by 2050, which um, I'm sure is not far away as it seems. Um, and so as more and more countries uh, pledge to cut their uh, carbon emissions as more and more uh, individual companies start to pledge their uh, goal to be carbon neutral uh, by relatively soon dates. Um, it is clear that the carbon offset world is ready to explode. So we want to um, today explore as, as uh, less set up some, some of these sort of broad themes within uh, what is AG's role um, in, in helping to, uh, to achieve some of these um, policy and, and individual firm objectives. So uh, with respect to carbon offsets, um, we're going to talk a little bit today about um, what are some of the business models that are out there to, to monetize uh, these carbon reductions by individual farms. Um, we're going to talk a little bit about some of the technical innovations that are, that are going on um, that will help improve um, ag-based uh, carbon sequestration. And, and then um, a little bit more from the farmer's perspective, you know, what are some of the challenges and opportunities to, to implement and profit from uh, these uh, various carbon sequestration uh, mechanisms? So um, with that, um, I'm going to start to turn this over to our uh, panel. Um, so we have three uh, experts uh, that can help guide us through um, some of these and hopefully many more issues that uh, will arise with respect to carbon offsets. Um, from Indigo, we have uh, Kari Hernandez, who uh, leads their, um, their carbon operations and, and offer marketing. Uh, we have Kip Tom, who uh, among many other hats he has worn professionally, uh, is the managing member of Tom Farms coming to us from the middle of the country. Um, and then we have Steve Webb, who similarly has worn many hats uh, within this, uh, including many on the research science part um, and, and now more in the executive role at the Global Institute of Food Security. So uh, with those very brief introductions, I'm going to now turn this over to Carrie to uh, tell us a little bit more about um, issues going on from the carbon marketing side. Very good. Thank you very much, Harrison, Michelle. Thanks for having me and, and this hosting this panel. Um, I think it's going to be a great discussion. And I'm excited to be here. So I'll start just with a brief overview of who Indigo is and where we fit in the picture. Um, we are a program for producing carbon offsets that works with growers in the United States. So the way this works is we help them add soil health practices or intensify soil health practices that they already have in place um, to produce carbon credits. Of course, that comes with all the agronomic benefits of implementing those practices. So it is generally on a journey toward improved land stewardship, which is a focal point for a number of our growers. How do we become or improve our stewardship of the land? How do we make sure we're taking care of it for the next generation? How do we make sure it remains productive um, and profitable for our children and our family for generations to come? So the way that we approach this is a couple of different kind of principles that are very core to how we operate. One is standards. So Indigo has set out to establish and follow very strict but meaningful standards for carbon credits and 
The reason that's important is it allows us to play in a global market for carbon offsets. And so we wanna make sure that whatever program we're creating is sustainable for farmers in the long term and gives them an opportunity to capitalize on a market where we're seeing increasing upward price pressure. So those standards around carbon quantification really drive a lot of our program design. And we believe uh, that they will be ultimately in the interest of the grower. The second thing is um, uh, that's really important about our program is offering supports to growers. So carbon credits themselves offer a form of financial support, but we also op offer operational support, technological support, things like agronomic expertise, decision tools, uh, calculators, cover crop selectors, the kinds of things that help you actually evaluate what some of your options are, get a bit more exposure and make decisions that are appropriate, not only for your farm, but for the specific field that you're talking about. The third thing that is really important to us is we've structured our program to have very aligned incentives with the growers. So we operate on a bit of a revenue share model, which means we only make money when the grower makes money. So when they sell a carbon credit, that's when we get paid and we don't get paid before that. Um, and we've really done that so that we will be incented to design a program that is truly focused on growers and their success and forces us to really put them first. So we're really excited about that. So our program today is fully operational in the United States. We're in 21 states. We have over 2 million acres signed up in our program and we are operating in the voluntary market. So I know there's some questions about policy and uh, compliance markets that are out there, but we operate in a voluntary market, which means we're selling to corporations who are making those climate neutrality or, or climate responsibility commitments. Uh, we have already sold to over a dozen buyers. We pre-sold carbon credits and we are in our first year of producing those carbon credits this year. So with Indigo, I lead the operations group for the carbon business. And uh, I'm very excited to talk to you about all of the things uh, that we've designed in our program and that we're trying to make really work for growers. So thanks again, Harrison, for having me. Great. Um, and now we'll, we'll turn that over to Kip. Well, thank you, Harrison. And I want to thank everybody that's uh, been a part of uh, seeing this uh, this uh, afternoon's time together for us to discuss this very important element of agriculture and food security uh, in this conversation today. You know, for 45 years, I was a family farmer and uh, I was still consider myself a farmer. But uh, during that time frame, I saw my father make several, many, many changes as I saw our neighbors. So there was a constant evolution. You know, we used to really clean till the soil. Then we got to the point where we used conservative tillage and then we come on to no-till. And then we got to the point where we were uh, using cover crops. And then we got into prescriptive agriculture using data science to really manage our farm and make sure that we were doing everything we could to increase productivity, lower our cost of operations and have less impact on the environment and the climate. I spent a number of years in San Francisco going back and forth and working with a couple different firms on developing those data decision tools that really helped a farmer understand what he was doing in his profitability. But at the same time, that same data could be used to understand what their what impact they're having on the environment. And at the same time, what are the, how much carbon are they really sequestering? And I think that's where I'm really looking forward to that part of the conversation later this afternoon here. And then most recently, about three years ago, uh, started a pathway to becoming a U.S. ambassador. I was the U.S. ambassador to the Rome-based agencies, and we actually ran the second largest budget for the United States uh, in international organizations next to NATO. But our focus was on food security. It's mainly in the developed world, developing world, excuse me. And these are the people who are so adversely impacted by the impacts of climate. So what we do, whether it's in the United States or in other developed countries around the world, it's up to us to do it. It's our moral obligation. It's our obligation to society to make sure that we can do everything we can to clean up the, the environment and making sure that going forward in the future, we're doing our part and continuing that progress. But I'm proud of American agriculture and I know what we're doing here. You know, we're doing a lot to sink that carbon today, whether you're in the dairy sector, whether you're in a crop side of it. Uh, there's a lot of us that are really focused on this today, but we have to make, make sure, we have to be very certain that 
not only are we sinking more carbon and, and hopefully capturing some revenue from that, but we need to understand we need to invest in people on our own farm operations. We need to invest in technologies and we need to make sure that we continue to increase productivity. There are competing farming systems out there today. One in the EU is of particular interest to me that I paid a lot of attention to and it's called agroecology. It goes back to a regenerative process where you know, they use no, uh, no fertilizer, no GMO seeds, uh, no CRISPR-Cas technology. They don't use any of the data science. And the reality is we have a moral obligation to feed the world. So we need to do as much as we can in sinking carbon. We need to do as much as we can increasing productivity, but make sure we work within our planetary boundaries. So that's the perspective I'm going to bring. And I really look forward to the conversation this afternoon. Back to you. And last but certainly not least, uh, Stephen Webb from Global Institute for Food, Food Security. Thank you. Thank you, Harrison. And again, I'm a little bit of background on the Global Institute for Food Security is we're a public private partnership that was established in 2012 between Nutrien the province of Saskatchewan and the University of Saskatchewan. And in case you didn't know it, I'm a Canadian and I'm living in Canada. So I've got a, a Canadian perspective on, on what is going on in this space. Our mission at GIFS is to work with partners to discover, develop and deliver innovative solutions for the production of globally sustainable food. And we serve a role as an innovation catalyst, connecting the ecosystem, advancing innovation and bridging the gap to commercialization to deliver resilient and sustainable food security for all stakeholders. I want to carry and, and, and Kip both mentioned the importance of technology innovation. And I liked Kip's comments about his own farm, his dad, adopting new tools and technologies that made economic and environmental sense. One of the things that I really believe is agriculture can have its cake and eat it too, in terms of being able to be both economically and environmentally sustainable. Harrison mentioned the growth in carbon markets, just a data point. These are billions of dollars. So Refinitiv is a subsidiary of the London Stock Exchange. And in 2020, they reported that the carbon market hit a record high of $323 billion, fourth consecutive year of, of records in spite of the pandemic, in spite of lower economic activity and lower emissions. What does this mean? increase in the number of emission permits and price. So we, as Harrison mentioned with the McKinsey report, we expect to see this in the foreseeable future. Question that we have and the interest that we have at the Global Institute of Food Security is how can agriculture contribute to lowering greenhouse gas emissions while remaining successful in the carbon economy? Again, echo what, what Kip Tom said about the responsibility, the obligation, the opportunity to in North America to be able to produce food in a sustainable manner for the world. And again, I think ag does do a very good role in reducing emissions. Soil is our second largest carbon store on the planet. Healthy soils pr uh, produce, promote healthy plant growth and help reduce climate change. One of the areas that we see ripe for innovation is measurement. And again, Carrie, Carrie talked about the validation, the trust, and in the carbon offsets that are being created. One of the problems we have in ag is we really do not have a clear picture or data sets to validate the claims that we are sinking carbon. And our current measurement tools do not provide the granularity that's needed for those decision tools for farmers on their farms, as well as helping with the policy. And in fact, it's created a perception that agriculture can be a contributor to greenhouse gas emissions. It's a half truth. And by developing new and better uh, measurement tools and technologies, I believe we can, we can disrupt that. Again, being able to demonstrate your sustainability, we need to be able to measure and compare. I think uh, the phrase that I've used when we've talked about this in Canada is it's ripping off a line from President Ronald Reagan when he was dealing with the Soviets, trust but verify. We need to be able to validate our performance against global indices. And again, we see the opportunity for ag and food as being a solution and not part of the problem. I look forward to talking a little bit more about our experience here in Canada because we have 
in Harrison's slide, you saw that big ugly, you saw the big ugly mark across the country. We have a carbon tax that's not just planned for implementation, but it is being implemented. And I was telling Harrison before, every time I go to the gas station, I get to fill up my car and my truck and I get to pay more at the pump. So I'm looking for carbon offsets for myself in the context of how can we use agriculture and food to be able to address some of the challenges that we're seeing. And again, I think ag and producers like Kip mentioned on his own farm are innovators. They are adapters and we need to be in a position to be able to provide the combination of measurement tools with machine learning, with the validation and the new business models that we'll talk about on this panel to be able to enable this reality. Again, I look forward to the opportunity to meet and talk on this project. And again, it's one of the ones that I, I do like because I think it's a wonderful opportunity for us in agriculture. Thank you. Great, uh, thank you, Stephen. Um, so again, uh, as Michelle mentioned at the beginning, um, uh, please uh, uh, submit questions under the Q&A tab. Uh, we have some rolling in. Um, I'm going to uh, take advantage of my moderator role here and um, start with some of my own questions. Um, so this one's a little bit for both Carrie and, and Stephen here. Um, one thing that I, I latched on to what uh, you both were saying is the need for standardization and verification. Um, so um, a little two-part question first for you, Carrie, and then for you, Stephen. So on, um, on the standardization side, you, you talked about um, obviously the need to do this to quantify the offsets. Um, I would be interested to, to get your take on, on what is what if any coordination we're seeing across um, different governing bodies to, to create a, a sort of more uniform um, standardization process, whether that be um, across local, state, federal, or even international type of agreements uh, that we might, um, you know, what, what's sort of the status there and, and, and where do you see that going? And then, um, you know, relatedly for you, Stephen, you know, you talked about the, the, the need for new technologies for verification. Where, where do you see us at right now? What are the stumbling blocks? What are the opportunities? Where do you, um, where do you see uh, innovation and technology um, serving um, as, a, as a role to help us in that, in that standardization uh, process? So Carrie, if you could. Yeah, let me, let me take a step back from it and just talk a little bit about the context of why this matters. And Stephen certainly mentioned it, that trust and integrity and confidence in this asset class is not only important, but unproven yet, right? We are creating an intangible asset class, something that you cannot see, you cannot measure yourself. And so it is only as valuable as all of its buyers and traders and producers have a set of standards that they agree to. Right? It's, the, it's the same concept as generally accepted accounting principles. The reason we have that is so that we know how we are comparing a standard set of financial documents such that we have a trust in how, thing, how, the, how we are trading assets. Right? And so it's the same thing for, for carbon. We need to have a standard way to measure and to value carbon so that we can ensure some actual free movement of this asset in an open market. So if you think about that, it's, it's you know, you can't go and count the bushels of corn. It's, it's something that you'll never be able to see with your hands. A company who is buying a carbon offset needs to trust that what is there is real. We approach this by thinking about a couple of standards, right? a couple of principles that underlie these standards that, that we use. Though there are three that I'll highlight. One is the concept of additionality. Additionality means that whatever we are quantifying as a carbon benefit has to be incremental. So the person on the other end of the transaction is purchasing a carbon offset, meaning they're purchasing a measured and real impact on the environment that wouldn't have already been there, right? This is an incremental impact. So that's the first one. Two is that it has to be real. Whatever procedure you're using, whatever technology you're using can never overestimate a carbon credit. We have to be confident that we have been conservative in those assumptions such that every single carbon credit we issue is real. 
The third principle is permanence. Now that means when a company is buying a carbon credit, they are not buying a temporary relief in the atmosphere. They are buying a permanent relief in the atmosphere. And so what that means is we have to structure a program that allows us to ensure that over time, any carbon credit we're selling is a permanent reduction in atmospheric greenhouse gases. So these principles have really guided how we have established standards at Indigo. Now there isn't a single governmental body or truly a single regulatory body, but there are entities that play in carbon markets that help set standards across multiple industries, not just agriculture, they do it in forestry, they do it in industrial uh, credit production. And so we work with a couple of those at Indigo. We work with the Climate Action Reserve and we work with VERA. The Climate Action Reserve is United States-based, VERA is global. So these are existing standard settings bodies that do this for carbon markets outside of agriculture. And we have partnered with them to develop a protocol for measuring soil carbon in a way that can be applied to agriculture. These are open source methodologies. These could be used by anybody. Right now, I think our program is the only one that is using them, but it has been done with the purpose, the explicit end goal of creating this standardization and creating a generally accepted measure of a carbon credit that comes from a farm. So I think you know we will see more and more discussion around how we make sure that these standards are being applied consistently. There might be other standards that are developed, but I think we need to, as an industry, it's a really important opportunity for us to come together and agree to what is this? Because at the end of the day, that's what makes it viable for a farmer. And that's what makes it, makes it sustainable for agriculture is if it works for the farmer. And Stephen, on the, on the sort of technology front of that, um, you know, where are we? What, what, what are the challenges? What are the opportunities you see for, for great, getting greater standardization, greater verification? Well, I think one of the things that I think we can all agree on is the way that we measure today is low throughput, costly, infrequent, and underrepresents what's going on. And I totally agree with Carrie that we need to be able to standardize it. And again, the current methods do not allow us to kind of go back and be able to do this at scale. Because one of the challenges that we have in agriculture is everybody's environment is different. The data sets that we have today, I mentioned in my opening remarks, lack granularity. There needs to be a, a, a national and an international framework, but it needs to be locally relevant. And the only way we get to local relevance is by being able to measure technologies, uh, new analytical techniques that are being developed at NC State, here at the University of Saskatchewan, at uh, the University of Nebraska, related around NIR tech technologies linked with machine learning. These are techniques that allow us to be able to generate representative data that's inexpensive, scalable, and being able to measure it over time. Because again, as Carrie said, this is there's a permanence to this. It isn't a recreational activity that you do for one season and then you switch. We also need to be able to get those larger representative data sets to be able to develop predictive outcomes and measurements to be able to predict the impact of environment, agronomic practices, and soil health on carbon sequestration. And then the ability to develop it, to have these new analytical tools to go back and confirm the results, not just rely on the algorithm says this, but to be able to go back and validate it. It's one of the biggest opportunities, I think, for innovation and the application of uh, a multidisciplinary approach to being able to solve this problem. One comment related to standardization that I'd make from a Canadian perspective is uh, we've been able to create here in Canada a diverse set of uh, stakeholders. The uh, a coalition of the, of the willing, if you will, that represent NGOs, farmers, uh, food processors, grain handlers, consumer groups, organizations like my own to work together to start to develop a national indice. And again, we recognize that it needs to be, uh, at least from our perspective, needs to be relevant to Canada, 
but also it needs to be tailored to the specific regions because as like the US, what happens in the Midwest with what happens in North Carolina, they're very different environments. And what makes sense from a carbon sequestration strategy in North Carolina doesn't make any sense here where I live in Western Canada, like cover crops do not make any sense for us here, but they make sense in other geographies. So again, I think that framework and standardization need to be there, but also the adaptability to make it, make it relevant for the local producer. Because again, we've seen the innovation and the drive for economic, environmental and social acceptance by our farmers for generations. I don't think any farmer wants to go back and farm the way their grandfather farmed. And I think what we need to be doing is looking forward with the best tools and technologies to be able to do this in an economic and environmentally sustainable manner. Great. Um, I'm going to I'm going to grab a question from the uh, from the chat now, and I think it's probably best for for Kara or Stephen. But I got a follow up to the question from the chat that I'd like to ask. Uh, ask Kip's perspective on. So uh, Stephen Pierce on the. Um, in the chat um, uh, brings up the point that we're talking about sequestration, but what about abatement? Um, should should we, can we, do we get credit uh, or do our farmers get credit for not only keeping stuff in the ground, but um, uh, not putting up as much stuff uh, to begin with? So for example, um, could we be more efficient with nitrogen fertilizer um, to create less uh, field emissions um, and embodied emissions uh, with fertilizer production. Um, so, uh, Carrie or Stephen, um, what is sort of the, um, the, the market for that or, or, or the crediting for that, if you will? And then uh, as a follow-up question, I, I'd be curious from you, Kip, as you put on your, your farmer hat um, for a second, you know, as you see all these different options across uh, the, the market, um, for sequestration, maybe, maybe for some of these emission things. You know, what, what do you see as the barriers to the farmer from getting involved? Is it too much choice? Is it too much expense? Is it um, uncertainty of profits? You know, where, do you, uh, where do you see the farmer in, in trying to, to make some of these decisions? So if anybody could first on that first one about um, sequestration versus uh, uh, abatement. Yeah, I'd be happy to take this one, Harrison. Um, it, or at least start and Stephen can add on. In Indigo's program, our carbon credits are actually CO2 equivalents. So that includes emissions abated as well as carbon sequestration. So we are able to credit for nitrous oxide, carbon dioxide and methane reductions, as well as carbon that has been drawn down from the atmosphere. One of the things that's really good about this is it gives growers a lot of flexibility. You know, you have some growers who say, okay, Maybe I've been a little liberal on the nitrogen. Maybe I can get myself on a program and I can make some adjustments. But you have other growers who are gonna say, no, I have, I've been using a really targeted nitrogen program. And if I, like, that's my insurance policy. And if I take that away, I'm now creating risk for my cash crop. And that's not, I'm not ready for that. That's not worth it, right? I still have to be able to feed my family next year. So that grower might say, well, I'm gonna start reducing my tillage, I'm gonna to plant a cover once I get you know, a, a cover with legumes where I can fix nitrogen, then I'm gonna feel better about reducing that nitrogen. And so it gives growers an opportunity to go in the program with a lot of flexibility. Let's find the right entry point, let's find the right transition. And we will credit you for the net impact on total CO2 equivalents under our program. Yeah, and so, so Kip, there's, uh, you know, Carrie put out a lot of different ways that one can jump in here and a lot of different strategies one can use to start um, generating some credits. Um, so so what, do you, what do you think it's gonna take for sort of larger scale adoption uh, across more farmers? What, what, if there is hesitancy, where is the hesitancy and what can be done to, to, to undo some of that? Well, you know, I wanna first out, I wanna, I wanna make a comment. It goes back to the prior discussion. I'll just take a second on that. You know, we look at this, we want to set standards. And I know that, you know, today, the topic of this discussion, we're primarily focused, I believe, on the United States. I can tell you working uh, within the UN and working with 194 countries, uh, coming up to one agreement uh, that is spans the world, 
on the standards is, is going to take time. I'm afraid that's going to slow us down. So let's focus on the United States right now. Hopefully we can get to those standards internationally in time. Now, in terms of this question, let's remember there's a lot of diversity in agriculture. There's a lot of diversity in farm size, uh, uh, education levels, those who, who have uh, accepted new practices and invested in their workforce, invested in their uh, rolling stock, their tractors that have two, three computers in it that are using all these different algorithms to seed the crop at the specific to the slope in the field, the soil type, or change the nitrogen rate on grow. A program that we've invested in that, that makes sure we don't use a single pound more nitrogen than we need to use. And then monitor it throughout the season and add as we need to. The solutions are there to do this, to reduce our, our carbon footprint, and many of us are already doing it. But we have some competing uh, segments within U.S. agriculture that says, wait, we've got, we've got farmers that don't have data systems. We have farmers that aren't even, aren't even connected to the Internet yet. And then we have those farmers that say they don't want to connect the Internet because they don't want their data to go somewhere else. Well, I think if we're going to have a, a solid program, as, as Steve and Carrie talked about, we have to be able to validate. And I don't know any other way to validate than to by using, taking our information, our data to, to prove what we've done, and then to have somebody that's actually monitoring and understand what that system delivers in terms of, of sequestering carbon and baiting it. So to, to me, we've got to understand there's going to be other farmers out here that aren't going to want to be a part of this. And what, are we willing to accept that they won't be a part of it? Or, or do we soften the the policy that is framed up around us and saying, well, you don't have to, we're just going to, if you no-till and use a cover crop, we're just going to assess so many creds to you. I think that's a disaster waiting to happen. We cannot allow that. We have to use data just as other industries do to manage their operations. Farming is manufacturing. I mean, a lot of people don't like to hear that word, but it is manufacturing. It's where we use a, a defined set of, a defined set of resources in a very structured manner in to have a desirable outcome. And that's what manufacturing is. And, and that's why we have to be using these data systems. And I certainly hope that uh, we go to a very robust system, we can prove what we're doing. I certainly don't wanna be one of those that said we delivered something and we didn't deliver it. And I know I heard Kerry say that, that would be a disaster for our industry if we over-promised and under-delivered. Yeah, Harrison, this is Steve, I completely agree. The need to be able to validate is is key. The question about abatement again, I think Kip nailed it. Where he said we don't want to put another pound of nitrogen on more than we need that makes economic sense. And again, that linkage between economic viability and environmental sustainability. One of the one of the big innovations that has impacted farming, and Kip mentioned it at the beginning, from you know how they till to no till. I mean, here in Western Canada, everything is no-till and there's a reason it's no-till because it makes economic sense. Fewer passes over the land, better moisture retention because we are dry land farming here in Western Canada and it helps sustain productivity, economic productivity. It also acts as a carbon sink. It was, it, we, they were doing carbon capture before they knew it was cool to do carbon capture. And I again see that linkage between the economic reality of farming because it is a business and the opportunity to do environmental good. And I think one of the things that I, again, sound like I'm like kissing up to Kip here, but that measurement piece is really important because mm -hmm. I think ag gets the bad rub. There's a perception that ag is part of the problem. I believe ag and food is part of the solution. It's the only industry big enough to take on this challenge that we have facing us globally. I do agree with Kip also on the international dogfight that setting an international standard would be, but it's an opportunity for leadership. And it's an opportunity for the US, for Canada to show the way. And again, I think that's, that's one of the reasons why I think this is a target rich environment for innovation at the business level, but also at the technology level. Hey, um, I'm going to grab another question. This is related to a point that both Kip and Steve have brought up, which is 
that there is obviously a lot of heterogeneity in, in farmers and farming practices and crops and operations and both in types of things that are growing and scale and size. Um, so uh, a question from Paul Yulonk, uh, sorry if I've not said that correctly. Um, uh, to Steve, uh, do you expect a carbon credit system to be flexible and adaptable enough to support a broad range of farming systems, or is this going to be something that's largely going to be um, something exploited by the large acre coin soy rotation crops that we'll see more in the, the middle of the country? I think to be successful, it has to be an opportunity for everybody to participate in. I think certain areas may be more geographically advantaged than others. Where I live right now, we have uh, we have forty percent of Canada's arable land. We have more more hogs in this province than we do people, and as a result, we can suck a heck of a lot of carbon. But it doesn't mean that we don't need a system that brings everybody in, and it can't be a free pass like Kip, you know, that the disaster scenario Kip described. It needs to be tailored for that local opportunity to make that contribution. That's, I think it needs to be inclusive and it needs to be the right thing. Because again, what we do here in Western Canada does not make any sense for any of the I states, for example. Trust me, after a day, I'm, it's going to snow here Friday, which <laughs> really sucks. <laughs> um, cold weather aside, uh, um, Carrie, uh, a question that keeps popping up by several uh, in the chat here um, is related to um, the length of term for these contracts. Uh, so what is a typical contract outlay in terms of how long um, the, 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 uh, the proposed plan uh, capture storage, how's it renewed, um, um, yeah, so a little bit more on the timing would be uh, would be something that it seems many are interested in here. It's a great question. Uh, we contract with growers for a period of five years, but our hope and aspiration is not that we have growers join us for five years and move on. Our hope and aspiration and expectation is that when growers get in and they start experimenting, it's not going to be perfect every single year, every single field. You're going to have to learn as you go. But if we are able to partner with them in the way that we aspire to, at the end of a five-year period, you will see benefits on your farm. Sure, you're going to get a carbon credit revenue stream, which will be great, but you're also going to see other benefits. You're going to see improved water infiltration. You're going to see reduced soil erosion. You're going to see fewer tractor passes, right? You're going to be saving money on your inputs. You're going to feel, uh, one of the things we hear from growers all the time is, I feel less stressed out. I don't have to panic if I get a couple of inches of rain, right? My, I'm not watching my fields wash down the road. It's staying there. It's helping me become more resilient as a farmer. Now, when you add these practices for the first time, sometimes it takes a couple of years. So the expectation is that you may not see a transformative change in the first year or two, but by the time you're in years four and five, you will be seeing the benefit and you will be reaping the benefits on the agronomic side as well as on the economic side. As we think about the overall profitability equation, you're hitting both sides of that, whether it's from reduced input costs or whether it's from more stable yields that are giving you more consistent production over time. Plus you've got this carbon credit revenue. And again, we're expecting that that price point continues going up as that demand is significantly outp outpacing the supply that we have today. So we contract you for five years because we want you to get in. We want you to give it a shot. We want, to, we want a chance to show you what it's all about. And we think that we're going to convince you. So the, the actual expectation is that growers are with us for a very long time, that this is a long-term journey together, it is a partnership. We're going to be sharing a lot of knowledge between ourselves, amongst our growers. We're going to be getting better as a system and as an industry. So it is a five-year contract with uh, hopes for many extensions. So uh, a point that you brought up there, Carrie, that I, I would like to explore more, and I think Kip, maybe you could uh, tell us a little bit of something about this. So as you noted, you, you, you got to work with them, figure out what works, what doesn't work. Um, how, how, Kip, do you think we could do a better job of um, relaying 
um, opportunities, relaying the science, relaying the market opportunities uh, to farmers. And then to put on your ambassador hat, how do we also take that globally? How do we take that to developing countries? How do we take that to, um, you know, sub-Saharan Africa and so on? You know, uh, I, I, it seems like that's a, that's going to be a big, you know, relaying that information seems like it's going to be a big component for getting, you know, wider spread adoption and really harnessing the potential benefits here. Yeah, well, certainly we got a number of questions there and I'll try to answer them in the same order. You know, as far as the farmer adoption and, and like I said, to, to make this robust, we've got to make sure that we don't have a system that allows some people to claim they're producing credits and they're actually sinking carbon to actually get the credits. So th this is where I'm saying we've got to come up with a system that's really uh, allows us to validate and farmers are going to have to invest. The second part of that question, or I guess the last part of that question was you, you were talking about how do we take this and, and move it around the world and try to help others? Let's face it, there's nearly 500 million smallholder farmers around the world. I, I don't like the word smallholder because no one wants to remain a small farmer, smallholder farmer. You're just asking for a continual cycle of poverty and subsistence living. So we hope that we can help those people get the scale at some point in time. But when you get into across to Africa, many of the places I've been, I've been in many countries in Africa, and what you see is they're, they are living, they're thinking 30 days out. They're not even thinking uh, like we do in the United States. We have the economic returns here. We can take the risk because for instance, on a farm like ours, if I wanted to, I could break our farm down into 10 meter by 10 meter cells and we can operate it specifically to that scale, to that granularity. And so that gives us well over a million opportunities in a year's time to experiment with different, uh, different ways to produce crops on our farm. It used to be that farmer had 40 opportunities in a lifetime to produce a crop, and he had only 40 learning experiences. Now we have millions with these data systems we have. But when you get into the developing countries, you go across the Sahel in Africa, uh, they're using the tillage tools that their ancestors used in Zimbabwe, for instance, uh, 2,800 years ago. We got a long way to go, but we've had We've had people do, giving undue influence across the continent of Africa, stating that the innovations that we've used to increase productivity in the United States is not sustainable, won't feed them. It's not good for the environment. And unfortunately, you know, they haven't had the right information to understand that systems like we're talking about today, systems that Indigo is promoting, systems that are taking place in Canada, the farmers embrace up there, those are the systems that are going to make themselves more sustainable longer term. But again, we've got to get them to looking down the road further, thinking generations ahead. As a farmer like me, I'm, I'm seventh generation. My kids are the eighth generation around the farm today. We've got to think further out and we've got to help others around the world look at it the same way. One final comment, Steve, when I make a comment about getting along with the international audience, I can tell you the US and Canada would be just fine and we typically always align. So uh, <laughs> I didn't mean that to you. I meant to many of the audiences in Europe, as an example. Yeah, I, I knew that, Kip. <laughs> um, Steve, uh, we we've, uh, another question that sort of popped up here and related to some of the uh, other discussions we've had. Um, you know, we've talked uh, a little bit on, um, the, obviously mostly focused on sequestration, but some on emissions abatement. Are there other angles uh, for instance, um, on, on pesticide use or, or other applications um, um, uh, on farmland that, that could potentially be sources of uh, emission reductions? Again, I think, again, the opportunity to be more prescriptive on the application to not be practicing corner to corner applications, you know, right product, right time, right place is absolutely it makes business sense and it makes environmental sense and it create that environmental and economic sustainability for our producers and being able to effectively tell the story builds the trust in the food system i think one of the things one of the things that i've noticed here because of covid-19 people in canada really food came from the grocery store 
And there were times during the during the, the pandemic where there wasn't f- certain items of food. I had my mom phone me up a year ago and say, what are you gonna do? You're the CEO of the Global Institute for Food Security. Why can't I buy two dozen eggs and two gallons of milk? They're rationing eggs and milk in Ontario. And the awareness of how important and how strategic the ag and food system is from a national security perspective, but also the role it can play in economic recovery, I think creates a wonderful opportunity for more innovation, more investment, and really critical for us to take, you know, to capitalize on the opportunity that this is that this has created. Again, better decision making tools. Kip talks about, you know, his farm being able to block it up into 10 meter squares. Again, I think that application we know we've got high spots and low spots in the field why would we fertilize at the same rate in those the the technology that companies have been developing for years and those decision making tools i think are really important one area that we're excited about in at gifts is the opportunity to create uh, products that have better uh, efficacy better environmental profile better human talks profiles. And again, leveraging what we know from the environmental world and being able to bring that that forward. Again, one of the things that ag is facing, the challenge that we face is change. And the speed of change is really quickly. And we need to be able to help bring our, t- our entire group along. So again, I think it's a great opportunity for us. Lots of things related to making sure that we're economically sustainable. Carrie, jumping back to the market side, um, as we discussed, there's there's a great potential for growth uh, as more countries um, issue national plans, as more individual companies uh, start to also put forth their net zero plans. Um, do you think the um, supply can can keep pace with demand? And, and relatedly, given this rapid change uh, that we're likely to see, how, um, how do you, how do you um, credit or, or deal with crediting um, when, say, prices expand rapidly within your five-year window? Do you, do you build in that sort of possibility for the market to really heat up in, in, those, uh, in those contracts? I love this question because it's a very important one to me. Um, all right, so I, I actually answered also in the chat, but um, I'll say a couple of things here. One is our growers get paid on based on market prices. We don't lock you in during contract period to a, a flat rate. It is based on market prices. And that goes back to that revenue share agreement that we have. Our incentive is to drive those prices as high as possible. So the grower makes more, and so we make more. We do it together, right? And that that is what opens this up for meaningful growth. And I think to the question of can supply keep up with demand at today's prices? No, we're already seeing that we are far oversold on the credits that we will produce this year. We have buyers waiting in the wings who just want to buy more credits. So we have to see and we have to be actively pursuing that market upside. So not only are we open to it and will we reflect that back to our growers, we have a team of people who are out there cultivating it. Right. We are we have a team of people who are telling the story of a grower who are making it real for these companies so that they understand it's not it's not just a decision you're going to make overnight. It's not just some, a flip you can a switch you can flip. There's real investment. There is risk. There's a lot of learning. It's really different than how a lot of people have been farming. And it's not a trivial change. So if we want to catalyze change that is non-trivial, we've got to be willing to pay for that. So there is, just like anything, right, there is an elasticity curve of how many growers are willing to accept what level of price. And as that price goes up, we'll start seeing the supply side of the market increase. One of the interesting dynamics here is on the supply side, you are beholden to the seasons, to the agronomic calendar, right? You plant and you harvest based on when mother nature tells you you are allowed to, right? And so what that means is, you know, there could be a company who's saying, I want 100,000 credits and I want them by the end of the year. Well, 
I'm going to have to go activate a bunch of farmers. I'm going to have to help them understand what their options are. They're going to have to do some planning. Let's say they're going to plant a cover crop. They're going to have to figure out where they're going to buy their seed. What seed are they going to buy? What's the right blend? What's the right density? How are they going to get it on? How are they going to terminate it? Do they need equipment? Who do they need to talk to? There's a, an immense amount of planning that needs to happen. Then you get to the growing season. Then you'd make the changes. Then you quantify the carbon credits. So we're talking about a pretty significant delay. Once we're in a, in a rhythm, we'll have kind of a steady stream. But when you are starting and activating a new population, there is a delay that the market is a little bit impatient for. You know, the, the buyers want credits today. And we need to understand and appreciate and make sure that all of our stakeholders understand and appreciate what it really takes to be able to produce carbon credits on a farm. One of the things we talk to growers about all the time is your actions today, the decision you make today is not so you can produce carbon credits today, it's so that you can get in the game. It's so you can start getting ready. It's so you can plan, it's so you can experiment. Like Kip was saying, right? you've gotta be able to have some learning and you're never gonna start with a drastic set of practice changes on your entire farm overnight. You're gonna start in a couple of fields. You're gonna expand over time as you learn and get better. And that ultimately is what will drive the supply side is you've gotta have the incentives, but you've gotta have the risk mitigate, mitigated operational plan. Because even if carbon credits shoot up next year in price, it's still not worth risking your cash crop. You've gotta be thoughtful about it. You gotta make sure that these pieces fit together. So I do think that when we, when we see the prices increasing in the market, it will become more accessible to more growers. Until then, we will be supply constrained and we need to be doing everything that we can to help growers get across the line. But every step of the way, when there is a market price that is out there that as soon as we are able to capture it, we will and we will flow that back through to our growers. Steve, we have some uh, technology specific uh, questions that perhaps you can help us with. Um, so uh, in particular, what are the specific technologies um, that you believe show the most promise um, to measure soil carbon uh, in an efficient and scalable manner? Um, and um, relatedly, what about the technologies for sort of ground, tro ground truthing or verifying um, the, the growers' um, actions and growers' claims in terms of their sequestration activities? So one of the uh, one of the companies that we partner with is a small startup called Fieldalytics, and again, it, I mentioned uh, it's not the only one that's in this space uh, that that's using uh, near infrared. And again, it's it's it allows for infield measurement, the data capture, the algorithms to generate not only within a spot in the field, but multiple spots in the field and being able to go back and measure again to confirm and measure over time. Again, when we look at the traditional methods of soil samples and the delays and the cost, we've commoditized the value of farm soils as opposed to really taking advantage of the, of the opportunity to, uh, to better manage the farms from an economic perspective and from an environmental perspective. So again, I see the linkage of the algorithms that, you know, Kip has mentioned this, the decision-making tools with the ability to use new measurement techniques, smaller, faster, uh, scalable uh, techniques. And again, th this is a small company that's up here in Canada, but like I mentioned, there's others in and around and that the uh, World Agritech Investment Summit in March, there were several of players in this space that were presenting technologies to help with, with the uh, measurement, not only of carbon, but also the uh, nutrient profiles that are in soil. And again, back to the abatement question. And Indigo and others are also looking at the impact because again, nitri nitrogen is significantly more of a greenhouse gas contributor than carbon dioxide is. So that total package is, is really, really important. And again, it's the ability to, so I did my PhD in an analytical chemistry lab. And if you couldn't measure, you couldn't improve. And I think we're on the, on the cusp of having tools and technologies that allow us to actually do this, to make it relevant to farmers. It has to be locally relevant for this to be widely used. Because again, as we've talked about, all the panelists have talked about is the 
farmers, I've yet to meet one that says he wants to go bankrupt or wants to do the wrong thing. And in fact, you've seen the adoption of new tools and technologies that have all contributed to better economics and much better environmental footprints today than we had 30 years ago. And you know, here in Western Canada, we have farms that have more organic matter today in the soil than they had two generations ago, which again, I think is, how often do you hear things are getting better? Most of the news is how it's getting worse. So again, I think those are things that we need to be able to measure, validate and share. Because again, I think it makes the whole system work better from the, the trading of the credits, but also the decisions that the producers are making on their farm. Tip, as we sort of think about the policy world out there, clearly um, uh, these, are, these are going to be um, uh, uh, national potentially in scope, uh, international in scope. Um, uh, and as Steve and, and Carrie both outlined, you know, the verification part is a no trivial step in that. Um, so one could imagine that um, the administration costs are going to be um, quite, um, quite large. Um, any concerns from, from you on the farmer end um, that, um, and, and on the, as a policy uh, a person as well, uh, that, um, that, that maybe we're looking at a system where the administrative costs um, might be more than what we can um, reward the, the farmers um, through these programs? I'll be very honest with you. I'm a, I'm a free market guy. You know, I like to see companies like Indigo and others getting out here and getting involved in this. I want to go with direct relationships and, and to accomplish these goals. It, you know, as a farmer, policy isn't always necessarily going to guide me. I want to do what's right for my farm, the environment, future generations, but that policy will occur. We know that we're probably going to see uh, some probably limitations of access to uh, some of the programs if we're not doing our part in sequestering carbon and our baiting. So I see that as a potential risk. Where I see the most opportunity is we're, we're going to sink this carbon. There's no question about it. It's going to happen at the farm. We have the ability to do it. We've been doing it for generations. The reality is I want to see a trading platform that gives me as a farmer the flexibility to price these credits. I want to be able to you know, if it's at the CME, I want to be able to buy, I want to be able to sell, I want to be able to buy puts or sell put or call. I want to be able to forecast or, excuse me, market several years out if I want to. Uh, those are the flexibilities we're going to need to make this an effective carbon trade market. We can talk about the cash market as one element of this, but we can talk about the futures market as well. And I think they're both going to have to figure out how they're going to work in tandem to meet the needs of the farmer while that farmer is doing what he needs to for future generations, but at the same time, as you said, meets the administration's goals. Now, let's face it, we run on four-year cycles. Uh, I, I can't predict uh, the outcome of the 2024 election, uh, but you know we need to see this continue on from one administration to another. We can't see this stop here because as, as several people have said, Steve and Carrie both, agriculture is not the problem here. We're the solution. And this is where we need to figure all this out and we need to do it now. And if it's just at the United States level, let's be leaders. Let's get this figured out how we can do this. And hopefully the rest of the world will want to copy us. Yes, uh, hopefully. Um, uh, Carrie, uh, uh, on the technology side, um, what sort of things are Indigo or, or other uh, folks in your space working on to sort of bring to market, if you haven't already, the, the vision that Kip just laid out there where a farmer can go and trade and look at uh, futures markets and all of uh, the sort of normal stuff that farmers are used to doing on their commodity uh, side uh, on, the, on the carbon offset side? Yeah. Yeah. Um... I will say we're not there yet, but we recognize that this is a place that we need to go, right? If you think about kind of where we are in the maturity of the development of this program, we are in the first year, 
right? We are producing credits for the first time. We are setting up the infrastructure, right? We are creating the, the fundamental platform that you need on which you could layer things like that, pricing tools, trading tools, you know, different kinds of um, portfolio management options. You know, we look at growers and we think they're going to want to manage a single farm, not only thinking about trading options, but thinking about different fields being in a different collection of pricing mechanisms or whatever it may be, right? Different horizons that you've committed uh, carbon credits from different fields. And so we're starting to think about that now. Um, it, it's not a near term, it's not in the next you know, year or two probably, but it's something that we do see being a kind of a core part of this. And there, you know, we have some other businesses. I focused on the carbon business, that's where most of my focal point is, but we also have a marketplace business that allows growers to trade grain. And so there's there's some interesting synergies there, right? There are some similar things that you want to be able to do on both platforms with both types of commodities in the future. So we are thinking about it, um, but today we're working on getting the, the infrastructure set up, make sure that we've got a solid foundation on which we can build. Um, also sort of related to, uh to the comments, uh, a, really, a comment that's related here and related to the these technology innovation sides. Um, Steve, could you uh, maybe uh, describe or discuss a little bit some of the um, some of the initial implementation costs? Um, maybe Carrie, you and I have some thoughts on this as well. Um, and if there's any um, mechanisms for perhaps some some cost sharing or or innovative contracting. Uh, that maybe you all are doing north of the border or, or carry, if you could comment on this as well, uh, that Indigo or others are, are doing down here. Because it certainly would seem for me as an economist perspective, oh, I could see a major bound uh, being um, uh, liquidity constraints that um, um, prohibit uh, uh, farmers from being able to make the initial capital investments to, to really uh, harness some of uh, this sequestration capability. So, again, I think this is some, that's a that's a great question. It's a it's a huge challenge. Kip used the phrase "farmers need to invest," you know, and farmers have been investing, and that's one of the big issues that one of the reasons why we got involved at the Global Institute for Food Security and the National Ag Index was how do we deal with how do we recognize the early adopters that farmers have been. And how do we how do we bring them forward? Because one thing that a policy framework has the risk of doing is incentivizing the wrong behaviors. And again, I think we've seen a lot of investment over time in in ag by farmers. And in fact, I was on a conference call in preparation for a dialogue session in preparation for the food summit in September. And you know, one of the producers that was on the call has just invested an additional $35,000 to reduce the amount of nitrogen oxide that his, his, his tractors produce. Again, it made sense from an abatement perspective. Again, there's no, in, the only incentive that he had to do it was for his own farm and what his collective is. I think there does need to be a way to think about from a implementation plan, how do we recognize and reward those types of investments. And again, that's maybe where governments can play a role to incentivize in, in making that adoption quicker. So our experience here in Canada with no-till is it took a generation. First time I ever traveled to Western Canada, I remember coming back and my mom and dad said, how was the farm? I said, holy crap, they've got only half the land in production. They were fallow. There was, there was fallow everywhere. And it was like, man, they could produce a heck of a lot more food. I can't believe they're not doing it. And now when you drive around Western Canada, you do not see that because of the adoption of no-till, but it took a generation to do that. And I think the, the challenges that we face with global, the need for global food, the rate of change, the adaptability, to for resiliency, we need to be able to find ways to incentivize the change even faster. So I don't have an answer. And I'd refer to the economist in the room to be able to provide maybe some insights on how that could possibly happen. So Harrison, sorry to put you on the spot. <laughs> well, no, I mean, there, there are certainly, um, well, obviously, as, as you all know, um, 
uh, farmers are no strangers to um, being inventive in their financing. Uh, uh, it's a high capital cost uh, industry for, um, for many crops. Um, so um, I think obviously there, there are lines of access there. It's probably the, um, you know, there, there's certainly uncertainties um, that creates um, hesitancy. Um, what we would call in the econ world, there's an option value option value of waiting, having your neighbor figure it out, and then you doing it. Um, and I think some of those barriers are probably um, as big or bigger than um, the financing issues that may uh, be um, required to, um, to implement some of the new um, technologies that come along with that. Um, but I'd be interested, Kerry, you know, how's sort of that burden um, split between um, uh, the grower, the market maker, uh, the eventual buyer of the credit um, in terms of, of some of these initial, um, well, first of all, I'm not exactly sure about what, what are some of the initial uh, costs that a, a, a farmer may have to um, take on to, to monitor, measure, uh, whatever, to actually, you know, verify the, the sequestration and, and then, you know, who, who's, How's that split working? Um, is it all just bundled into that carbon offset price or are there some other mechanisms you all do to, um, to uh, help finance this? Yeah, so there's a couple of different questions that I'm hearing here. One is let's talk about the costs. One is let's understand the supports that are of various types. And then three, let's talk about um, different ways of, of attacking the kind of the financial component of that. So. On the cost side, it really depends. In the Indigo program, there are no costs associated with monitoring, with verification, with measurement. We fund all of that. So if you are selected for soil sampling, for example, we deploy soil samplers to your field. We take the sample. We pay for the lab costs. We process the results. We give you a report. No cost to you. That's a part of what indigo's value add is, is we are taking the practices that you have done as a farmer and the data that we've kind of touched on data a couple of times. We should come back to this topic. This is a big one and an interesting one, but we take that and then we go from there and we fund the rest of the program. So the measurement, the verification process, the credit issuance, buyer operations, all of it goes to indigo. So the costs in our program are the direct costs associated with making practice changes. And that's going to depend on what practice changes you're making. If you're reducing nitrogen, it's a negative cost. Right? You're gonna, there's an immediate benefit to you if that is you know, part of the plan that makes sense for you. If you're planting a cover crop, you're gonna see some incremental costs, right? Because the seed is not free. It's gonna cost you 20 bucks an acre. It's gonna depend on the blend. Um, the application is not free. Termination, you're gonna have to have the equipment. You're gonna have to find somebody to help you do it. Um, so it just is going to depend on what practice you're going for, what combination of practices. So the we kind of separate that, right? Because there are also other benefits to doing those practices and other reasons that you would. So the growers tend, in our program, the growers focus on that component. We focus on the credit production costs. So when you think then about the costs, I, it sounds like this is kind of in the broader barrier or the broader umbrella of barriers to being able to implement these practices, right? And one dimension is financial. But there's also a dimension that is operational. There's also a dimension that is uh, social or cultural, right? We, we touched on this a little bit of, you know, if no one in your county is planting cover crops, do you do it? If you're a renting farmer, is your landlord going to think you're the lazy grower if you didn't till your fields, right? There's, there are so many kind of social norms that some of these practices are really standing up against. And so across those things, you know, Indigo really tries to help and support growers and break those things down, right? We can't, we can't eliminate all of it, but we are trying to design a program that helps to reduce them as much as possible. So a couple of things that I'll highlight. One is um, digital tools and decision-making support, right? There are, there is a very wide range of changes that you could make that would make you eligible to produce carbon credits. And you need to decide what is appropriate, what is right, what is solving problems that you have, or what, what makes sense for each of your fields. We might be able to help you find something that isn't super capital intensive, that does improve 
the whatever the agronomic challenges that you're facing that does give you a path to creating credits. Like we could start at kind of a lower investment scenario. We also could do things like connect you with other growers in our program. We have the largest program on the market. We've got growers who've been doing these practices for decades. And we've got growers who are just learning about them now. We've got kind of everybody in the middle. So we have a really good opportunity to be able to say, hey, why don't you guys talk to each other? You guys are, you know, two, three counties apart. There's a lot of learning and sharing, and it's not what Indigo tells you to do. It's what makes sense for you on your farm, in your region, based on what you're growing. And so there's a lot of opportunity there to think through the operational implications, to think through the kind of cultural and social challenges that you face. Um, because those are, they're, they're real, depending on where you are and depending on, you know, their specific situation, they are real. Uh, but that connectivity with other growers and other resources, I think is really important. So whether it's, you know, a retailer network or an agronomy network, or whether it's other grower, I mean, a grower like Kip, you know, we'd love to send growers to get to know growers like Kip who are just kind of starting new or on their journey, right? And so there are those kinds of things that can help you think through some of those barriers and maybe make them a little bit less tall. On the financial side in particular, today our program and our offer is really at the credit production stage. We do have a plan to kind of advance payments to a grower, but it's still after we've seen what their practice changes are. And we know that this is important. We know that this is a barrier. We know growers feel like they are taking on kind of the burden of the change themselves and we want to be able to support that. So we are actually doing kind of a series of pilots right now where we're testing out different versions of financial supports, whether it is something like financing that credit kind of at the time of enrollment, which could be through a buyer, it could be through a bank, but we're looking at different ways to do that. We're looking at whether there are cost share options or subsidized options where you know we've got a, an indigo partner who is kind of on deck and ready to go whether it's a you know seed supplier or an agronomy network where you know we're kind of helping our growers get connected and and realize some of those benefits so we don't have right now our offer is is very very much focused on the carbon credit that you produce but we understand this is important and we are exploring and i think as we continue to grow we'll see what else we can do on the cost sharing and kind of financial support side. Well, uh, very interesting stuff from everyone. Um, thank you all so much. This has been a great conversation. I've certainly learned a lot and I'm excited to uh, take some of this to the research areas. Um, I, I wish I could have had more colleagues um, <laughs> in the room with me. I'm sure they would have had about 500 more questions to ask all of you. Um, but again, thank you all very much. I'm going to turn it over now to Michelle uh, for some concluding remarks. Yes, I just want to reiterate, thank you all so much. Uh, this was an amazing panel. And on a personal note, it was really fun getting to know all of you. And it, we've been working on this for a little while now. And I really appreciate it. And Kip, thank you for joining us from Indiana. And Stephen, it's very nice and warm here in North Carolina. I have a guest room. If you want to avoid that snow, you are always welcome down here. So thank <laughs> you, know you. Yes. And Carrie, thank you again so much. You really did a lot of work to help us pull this panel together. And we really appreciate you and Indigo's participation. I also want to thank our partners again, Ag Start and Ag Launch and our regional sponsors and I want to remind everybody that we have the virtual networking now following this so if you will see in the chat below not in the Q&A but in the chat there is a, a link that you can copy and paste and it'll open up a whole nother meeting for you and we will talk to you soon and recording will be up on Monday so thank you everybody thank you Michelle thank you Thanks, Thank you.